is Todd and this is Pat. So we want to talk a little bit about the enterprise, mobile, ease of use, and security. Ease of use and security are at odds with one another. These guys are trying to help figure that out. So Todd, you want to start? Yeah, usually um, the main, when you think about information broadly and access to information broadly, there's two diametrically opposed things. One is no networks, no devices, no information freely available. That's very secure. On the other extreme is everyone getting everything that's more usable. So companies are really struggling to find the balance between these two extremes. And I think for a long time, it was people were over-rotated toward locking things down, having a secure network, making it very impregnable, impregnable from all threats. And we're at an interesting time right now. You're seeing a tension between opening more up, being more permissive with things like cloud computing and mobile computing. But at the same time, you're seeing breaches and headlines in the newspaper every day about huge breaches of confidentiality and security. And companies are struggling to kind of strike that balance. It's an interesting time to be in the industry. So tell me about what uh, Okta's doing in that area. Okta is an identity management company. We sell the businesses and let them give them a platform really to integrate all of the identities across any application or service they would want to use. So end users get one portal and one user ID and password to log into all of their services. And IT gets one service to integrate it all together and make sure that the right people have access to the right information and it's integrated across all the platforms and they spend less money keeping it all running and they're more secure because they can do better holistic policy across the whole environment. Pat? What do we do? What does Deem do? <laughs> So uh, Deem, the easiest way to think about Deem is it's sort of the Amazon of B2B commerce. So it's a, a one-stop shop for employees to come into, and whether online or mobile, and increasingly mobile, uh, which we'll talk about. But it's the one place they can go to buy all of the products and services they need. So you can book your flight to Vegas, get your hotel, get your car service, get your dinner reservations. And the difference between Deem and Amazon is that when you buy something through Deem, your company's corporate policies are incorporated, so you're guaranteed of getting reimbursed. So you book your trip, it's with your company's negotiated deals with their preferred merchants or suppliers, and when you do that, it updates your expense report, you get reimbursed. So it's really just, again, the Amazon of B2B, but the nature of the content and the, the things that employees are buying it's really, it has to be mobile first, right? It's booking a trip, you're living on the road. The power users for our, for our service are really knowledge workers, salespeople, people who are living in the field or, or distributed. Well, I was gonna say, I was, I, I was, we were talking backstage and I was asking, um, I was asking, we never got a chance to finish the conversation, I was curious about when people use, when people buy Deem and they subscribe to the service, how much is it because they can't build mobile experiences themselves versus another driving factor? Yeah, so we've, we today have about 29,000 companies that access our service. And I was, I was sharing with Todd that even the most skeptical, cynical CIOs that four or five years ago said, we, we can build all of this ourselves. We don't need you kids from Silicon Valley. This is, you know, you don't understand security, we understand security, don't try this at home. It doesn't even occur to them now. It doesn't even occur to them to try to build this on their own. So they have to have outside parties, Silicon Valley innovators doing this. And it all started with the bring your own device revolution. And with that came the applications, the consumer apps. With that came the demand from the internal employee population. And the inmates run the, the prison, as some of my friends who are CIOs like to say. And it's not an option, but to give an employee a consumer-like experience, but that's safe and secure and in policy. We see similar trends in our business. One thing that is also interesting is that um, companies have to do two things. One is that they have to take their internal operational applications, the things that get their employees paid and that keep their salespeople armed with information and make those efficient and world-class that they want to retain and get the best talent. But they're also, every industry is under pressure to build better solutions for their customers and actually become a technology company because it's not enough just to make your employees productive, but you actually have to have the best mobile app for your customers and have to give customers mobile experiences and web experience that are equal or surpass your mobile only or your upstart competitors that might be 
um, coming to you and, or coming to you and having a choice between an upstart competitor like um, you know an Uber or you're the taxi company, how do you make a mobile app that competes with Uber? And um, what we've seen is that they want solutions not only that can be employee facing and automate employee access, but also will give them tools and a platform to build into their solutions so they can build better solutions for their customers. Do you see the same thing in your world? We do. We see the exact same thing. Um, you know, it started with the demand side, with the user, with the employee of the corporation. But on, in our business, we have a whole other side of the network, which are the sellers, the car service companies. So little known fact, we are the Uber of B2B, for lack of a better description. We started before they did. We connect 8,500 merchants, brand name merchants like Boston Coach, Empire, you're probably any of your major local providers where you're all from, and we connect them to our cloud network and now increasingly mobile, and to be honest, they would be dead, dead in the light of Uber and Lyft without mobile experiences. So it's, it's the entire ecosystem. It's a competitive disadvantage now if you're not native mobile. Mobile's not an afterthought. I was telling Todd, it's not even mobile with anymore for us. It's really a mobile first design. Uh, engagement internally for our apps and the need from all the third parties in our network. Is that a, even a hard sell anymore? It's, it's not. I mean, it, it was. I mean, I'm, I'm like Yoda. I've been doing this for like 400 years. So I, I was on a panel earlier in the, on the center stage and I was saying, oh, look, I've been around long, so long that Mark Benioff and I would sit around 15 years ago with audiences about this size talking about the future of on-demand before it was called SaaS, and people laughed at us. And now the idea of not being native SaaS, the idea of not being native mobile, is kind of crazy. So I'm not saying we have an easy job, but it's a lot easier now than it's ever been. Actually, I did an experiment. I walked around. Um, there's a lot of little companies, new companies, innovative companies displaying out here. And I walked around to actually 75, and I asked them about their technology. And um, of the 75, Zero were building software companies, on-premise software companies. Zero. No. Um, and of the people displaying, the, the st companies that step up, which are buying displaced booths, uh, booth space, zero were software companies. That's right. And then, so I also asked, I said, um, when you do your development as a company, what's your primary development platform? How do you write your code? What do you, what do you work on? A couple of very interesting things. They all use Macintosh. Developers all use Macintosh. 15 years ago, could you imagine that? Yeah. Walking down a developer floor and seeing all Macintoshes, um, and then the second thing was that was that they all are starting with mobile. That's right. Every one of them. It's mobile a big first. Thing. So so th think about this, and and this helps to explain the arms race that's going on. You've got legacy software companies like SAP, and Oracle, really the dominant traditional software companies, that did what all incumbents do in the face of new technology, right? So. Larry went out there and sort of first trivialized cloud and, and, and SaaS, called it a toy, right? And then he demonized it, said it wasn't safe and secure. Hasso did the same thing at SAP. And when they realized that they were so disadvantaged, they went on a buying spree. So SAP's now spent $15 billion in three years buying software legacy software companies with a hybrid cloud model to replicate what we do, for example. Oracle has spent tens of billions of dollars. I don't have the total purchase price. But the interesting thing about this is the companies that they think are the, the innovators, the last generation of cloud companies, are about to be disadvantaged because they're not mobile first. And there is zero possibility, in my opinion, that companies like Ariba, companies like Concur and others, are going to go into these legacy software companies with all these antibodies and wholesale rewrite their stacks to be mobile first. So despite between the two of them, I'd say they probably spent 70, 80 billion dollars, they haven't really bought anything. They're as, they're as disadvantaged today as they were three to five years ago. I don't know, do you agree? Yeah, I, I do agree, and I also think that the people say that um, the market for mobile first and cloud first enterprise solutions is, uh, you know, all the new categories have been defined. There's Workday for human capital, and there's obviously Salesforce.com, and you know, the other big names you hear of They've all been defined, but the opportunity for new companies and innovation is just getting started, and it's, it's very massive. They think that because Oracle has bought up Eloqua, Salesforce bought Exact Target, all these acquisitions have happened, the opportunity is out there, but it's totally wrong. I think a lot of times when an acquisition happens, it slows down innovation and creates a whole new opportunity for another wave of companies around that. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, 
I said this a little on stage earlier, but I said SAP is where all innovation goes to die. And I you know, said it to be fun, but it's a reality. I mean, when SAP and Oracle buy these companies, how long do the founders stay? In fact, there was a, a, p a few pieces this week, at least in the Valley, in the, in the tech rags, uh, around Google has been able to retain a bunch of their founders. I think it's like two thirds of the founders of the companies they've acquired have elected to stay. That's awesome. That's because Google still has the innovator DNA, right? And other companies are less good. Well, if you look at SAP and Oracle, the traditional incumbents, everybody leaves one nanosecond after their retention pack ex uh, package expires. Concur was acquired for $8.3 billion and two of the three founders left within three weeks. I mean, is there really any possibility of that company innovating? It's not gonna happen. When I, I um, when, when you walk around the show floor out there, it's interesting, all these interesting ideas and crazy ideas and sometimes the crazy ideas are the best, but when entrepreneurs come to me and ask for advice on what company to start or what to do, I tell them, I say, go for the boring stuff. Just look whatever company SAP just acquired or Oracle and just acquired that. and go build it. <laughs> but that. wait a minute, they are, there's a company already doing that and there's a big company that now is going to invest in it. It's like, no, they're going to kill it and your opportunity in five years is going to be amazing. Look at uh, the company ServiceNow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. ServiceNow story. So it's what like, would you do right now if you're, if you're one of these founders? I'm busy. I have a job. You're busy. <laughs> so if you're one of these founders I'm going to go, go back to my hotel room and work. <laughs> or you're one of the founders. There's 8,000 people here, a bunch of founders. And you were giving them advice on designing, though, from a pure architecture perspective, not just for mobile first. What, what lessons do you have that you would share with them around balancing the needs of ease of use with security? Um, the first thing I would say is, uh, and again, this is not, maybe not that controversial, but I would say um, build, build your whole back end on Amazon. Amazon's winning. It's going to win the cloud wars. Um, it's, gonna, it's a race to the bottom in terms of pricing. Ride that economic wave, build it on Amazon. If anyone works for Google Cloud, I apologize. I think Amazon, I'd use Amazon for the back end. Um, the second thing I would tell them would be, you, you know, you gotta design for mobile first and your mobile experience has to be really, uh, really good. But I think in more categories than you'd expect, it has to be mobile and other things. Mobile and desktop, mobile and web. Um, not just, it can't just be mobile at the expense of everything else because in most application categories, the users want an alternative. They have to do a bunch of work, they want to sit down at their desktop, they want mobile notifications, or it's like an adjunct. It's mobile first, but it's not mobile only. So that's the other thing I would say. And then just the simple things in, when you're building up your product or your company, which is it, early on in your life cycle, and I'm sure, I've seen your product, and I'm sure you guys did this, uh, build user feedback and design very early in the company's life cycle because they just worry about getting something working or something that'll scale or something that uh, is functionally rich, you're gonna not make it and not invest and in, not build processes in the company to make it usable and consumable by an average end user. So, so I agree and, and, and my advice would be, of course, start mobile first, ride the AWS wave. I mean, I'm, again, I've been around forever. Setting up a site or an environment now is somewhere between three and 5% of the cost of when I started my company 15 years ago. The other issue we all had back then was the cost of acquisition, and now you've got a couple of billion people out there. You can get to them via mobile very quickly. But, but here's the counsel I would give you. Don't worry about fighting the feature functionality war in the enterprise with the incumbent, okay? Those features look intimidating in an RFP checklist or in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, but the user population is running things now. So you need to optimize for the user, delight, absolutely delight them with a killer experience, go lighter weight on the feature functionality, and more importantly, or most importantly, figure out a land and expand business model, develop this in such a way that it can be widely adopted and distributed by employees of these companies, help them with a particular pain, and I assure you, people will notice inside the company, this will ultimately roll up to the VP of sales or the CPO or CFO, and they're gonna want the enterprise edition. But you've gotta seed that market to lower your enterprise costs in your longer term sales cycles. That would be my advice. Yeah, it's interesting. We, um, at Okta, we, uh, we have a little bit of a different approach. Our thing is a security and infrastructure solution that happens to be loved by the end users. Going back to your first point about end users like it, it's easy to use and it's secure. And we actually sell tops down. So we, we go in and talk to the CIO or the CISO and say, 
you know, you should buy this across your whole enterprise. Um, so it's a little bit counterintuitive for a lot to a lot of modern things that start bottom. But your up. infrastructure, right? Yeah. Or apps. Yeah. So we need to app app developers need to seed at the user level. You need to protect the enterprise from crazy people like us, right? I mean, I think that's right. You're like that's an arms dealer, mission right? Statement. There's, there's a war. There's a mobile protecting war. Protecting the world selling, from crazy Patrick Grady. I got a couple uh, industry level questions. There, you're talking about Oracle buying things and basically killing them. SAP. There have been rumors in uh, the news media, which don't make sense to me, but they're out there that Oracle is going to buy Salesforce. Does that make any sense at all? I used to, I used to work at Salesforce. Um, I was VP of engineering for products and platforms there for six years before I started. Um, six years before I started Okta. Um, and I actually have uh, insider knowledge of this that I'm going to share with all of you right now. No, I'm just kidding, I don't. Uh, everyone's like, holy shit. Um, I, I think that the whole thing is, I think it's kind of, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing that someone can just put out a story inside it and where the, the, the purpose of this organization is to get people to come to their website and tell them and get clicks and eyeballs and advertising, put out a story and say, unattributed to any source, yeah. and say there's this big news event that's going to move the stock, and then you can trade the stock and short the stock, and there's no attribution. I thought, you're a journalist. I thought in journalism you had to have attribution for these the, stories. The that's Times. so old school. Well, the LA Times did not run that story. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wasn't it? So, okay, that's my first kind of maybe high-level point about it. Um, so I think there's a lot of shenanigans going on, and I think you'll hear Salesforce in the next week do a big PR campaign about telling their side of the story. They're just kind of getting ready right now. Um, the other thing about it is that every acquisition that happens, the that usually happens when they usually happen when either the board of the company being acquired is has some doubt or some fear, and they're not starting from a position of strength, or the acquirer just pay so much crazy amount of economics that they overcome that. The example of the board or the acquirer are paying so much crazy economics that they can overcome a strong board and a strong acquiree is Facebook and WhatsApp. It's like, I don't care how much conviction they had at, at WhatsApp, when you get offered like 10% of Facebook and a seat on the Facebook board and to you know, get lifetime free supply of whatever they gave, yeah. you're gonna do the deal. That's right. Salesforce right now is the board, I, I don't have any inside information, I don't know much about it, but just from an outsider, they really have a position of strength right now. They are very predictable in their earnings, they're growing very quickly, they have multiple product lines, they have, a, I mean, it's on and on and on the strengths. So to get the deal done, I would be very skeptical that they would blink first. I think the acquirer would blink first and not want to pay what they would take. Yeah, so I would just add, I totally agree. If I look at pattern recognition of being in the valley for 20 years, and if I look at the math, so Salesforce's market cap is 50 billion. It would, it's inconceivable that the board, setting aside Mark for a moment, the board would take less than a 40 or 50% premium. When you, when you pencil that out, the, the universe of companies that could afford to buy it and could then justify it to their shareholders is infinitesimal. It would be a Hail Mary pass by uh, Sacha and the Microsoft guys to get in the cloud. Uh, Google can afford it, given their market cap and the cash on hand, and, and really not many, not many others. I'm going to write that uh, if the rumor comes up again. <laughs> well, um, well, I guarantee you, though, it will not be Okta. We it do not have, we <laughs> yeah. have the cash. Yeah, we're not. We're not one, oh, I will say one last thing on this, because this is really important. Sure. It's, it's, it's very, very, very important to our industry, because it's a turning point. You mentioned the valuation and who can do it. Can, these, can Oracle do it? Can Microsoft do it? Uh, could EMC do it? What are these companies? These are the last bastion of the old guard. That's right. And when you have the, the first leader, the first bastion of the new guard, which surpasses the valuation that the old guard can buy, what does that mean? It means there's a new guard that's going to be independent and grow up and be, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Real quick, one thing, Apple, IBM. What do you think of that matchup in the enterprise? I don't think, you mean the partnership? The microphones yeah, the partnership. Well, I think that you have a company that, in IBM, that is, they're serious about the enterprise. <laughs> and I think you have a company in Apple that is. There you go. You plug it in. Not that, not, it's not clear that they're very serious about the enterprise. So I think that um, until that Apple shows that they're really going to be serious, it'll be kind of business as usual. And someone doesn't like my answer backstage. 
<laughs> yeah, I think they're. I think it's time to go. Thanks, everybody. Please give them a round of applause. I appreciate uh, your time. Your time too. Thanks.